Good morning, everyone. It is Alby from the front lawn of Elm City Church. We actually do have a building. Surprise, surprise, although we've been meeting on the internet for the past 12 weeks. I wanted to announce that next Sunday, June 21st, 10 a.m., we are having our first regathering service. We waited a couple of weeks to kind of see how things shook out, but we are excited to come back. And we're doing it on the lawn the first two weeks, specifically because we can fit more people and we want to have our first two services. We're all together as one big church body. So I encourage you, come on out 10 a.m. We're going to send a sign-up sheet so we can get an idea of how many people are coming. But we are very excited to gather in person. We've missed it so much. See you then. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Church at Home with Elm City Church. We are so glad that you joined us today. Take a second now and let us know where you're tuning in from. You can write the name of your city or town right in the comment section. Here at Elm City Church, we love to sing. So that's what we're going to do now. Why don't you join us in a time of worship?
Happy Sunday, everyone. Justin here and one of the pastors of Elm City Church, and I'm excited to spend some time with you guys today sharing from God's Word and from my heart. You know, the past couple of weeks, we've taken some time as a church to look at the theme of unity, and today we're going to go back to uh, the series that we've been in in the book of Colossians. And just as a quick refresher, if you're like me, I know you need to get caught up on where we've been. The book of Colossians was written by a guy named Paul as a letter to a brand new church in the province of Colossae. As a whole, the letter that he wrote addresses several different topics, including encouragement, a reminder of the gospel, and the glory of Jesus. But it also addresses other things like false teaching and spiritual immaturity. So it's sort of a mixed bag. And like any book of the Bible or a specific passage from Scripture, we're trying to figure out what this is saying and how it can and should be applied to our lives today. And the beauty of the Word of God is that it's timeless. It's always speaking with power and authority to something in our modern context. And that's what we're going to try to figure out in our time. That said, there are multiple themes uh, that we could highlight from our passage, uh, but I want to zero in and focus on uh, one thing that stood out to me as I was reading this past week. In our short amount of time, I want to look at the theme of spiritual maturity. I want to read for us again uh, in verse 28 and 29, the last two verses of our passage. And it says this, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. What we find in these verses has often been referred to as Paul's philosophy of ministry because it's here where Paul reveals his ultimate goal for the Colossian church, and subsequently, every disciple everywhere in every time. 
Everything orbits around his point. And that's that he wants to move people towards spiritual maturity. And so to this end, it shows us that he toils and he struggles, working toward this goal through the power of God's strength. One of the reasons that this is so powerful is because, uh, because of where Paul came from. Uh, you know, Paul is a guy that went through an incredible transformation. In his early life, he was known as Saul, and he actually was the one causing the persecution for early followers of Jesus, uh, just like the Colossian church. He was actively engaged in causing pain and hardship and throwing people into prison for sharing the message of Jesus. Listen to how he puts it in his own words as he reflects on his life in Acts chapter 22. He says, I persecuted this way, that is the church, to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. What's so incredible is that now the complete opposite has happened. Paul had this life-changing encounter, and he is now, as we see in our passage, working towards the development of other Jesus followers. Paul was used to putting people behind bars. And now he is writing this letter to the church in Colossae, and he's writing to them from a prison cell. And perhaps you're watching today, and and, um, church is a newer thing for you, or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. But either way, I want you to see that the focus of this story today, as we look back at Colossians, is not Paul and how awesome he is, but rather the king that he represents. Jesus is the hero of every story, and Jesus is pursuing you, just like he did Paul. Jesus has the ability to turn your world upside down, wherever you are today. And so what does it mean to be spiritually mature? What does it mean, what is Paul getting at um, when he wants us to move towards spiritual maturity? That's his goal for us. What does this look like? Well, if his goal is to move people towards spiritual maturity, we ask ourselves, what does this look like in our daily life? And so it's, it's easy maybe to point out what it is, um, but I'd like to start by pointing out what, it, what it's not. Um, I think that might be helpful for us today. First of all, spiritual maturity is not an aging process. You know, gray hair or no hair is not an indication that someone is mature in Christ. Just because we're aging does not mean that we are necessarily progressing in the faith. I've met a lot of uh, older Christians who still have, you know, a long way to go, you know, and they would, they would admit that to you. There's things that Jesus is doing in their life and working on them to this very day, and they're, they're up in their older years. Um, spiritual growth is not determined by the calendar, There are many things that Jesus wants us to continually grow in each year of our life. So spiritual maturity is not an aging process. Second, spiritual maturity is not automatic. Uh, No living thing comes to maturity automatically or instantaneously. This is why the writer of Hebrews makes statements like, like like this, go on to maturity in Hebrews chapter 6. It says, let us go on to maturity. Uh, There's this progressive nature to this process. And so to all of our uh, recent graduates, I want to just say congratulations. Congratulations on a job well done this year. Whether you graduated from uh, high school or, or college, you know, you, you put in work and you've, you've arrived. You've achieved that next step. And you, if anyone else, can attest to the fact that when it comes to gaining intellectual maturity, there really is no alternative to the painful working through prescribed courses and reading and writing and application. And the same is true of spiritual maturity. Growth involves effort. It involves discipline. It involves renunciation and perseverance if we want to see results. I love this quote by Dallas Willard. He said, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. As long as our foundation for growth is secure, we can rest assured that it will take effort to become more like Jesus. 
Spiritual maturity is not automatic. Well, third, spiritual maturity is not equal to the possession of biblical knowledge. This is really important for us to understand. The more time I spend in ministry, the less I am impressed by hearing about somebody's vast uh, biblical knowledge. Now, you might know scripture. You might be able to, to quote scripture on the fly. You might be part of, you know, five Bible studies. You might even know some Greek or Hebrew. But I want to say this. If more knowledge of the Bible isn't increasingly leading you to more Christ-like actions and attitudes, if our knowledge of scripture isn't backed up by our doing of scripture, then we're missing something really big. Because beliefs matter. You know, having right doctrine and theology matters. But those are not necessarily the hallmark for what it means to be mature in Christ or what Paul's getting at when he wants to lead us to maturity. It's part of it, but it's not the, it's not the kingpin. So now that we've looked at a couple things that spiritual maturity is not, um, I'd like to talk about what spiritual maturity is in our remaining moments. So the Greek word Paul uses to describe maturity is the word teleos, meaning complete or full grown. It implies this ripeness in character and experience, which is why he often uses the analogy of the development in in an adult compared to like the immaturity of a child. So if this is Paul's goal for the Colossian church and for you and for me, how do we grow? How do we mature in Christ? And I want to suggest three avenues today that might be great um, grounds for, for our growth. Three environments that I think will provide us some context for spiritual maturity and ongoing growth. And they are emulation, information, and examination. First, emulation. Maturity in Christ means developing Christ-like character and conduct. To describe this, we could go through the entire biblical uh, catalog of all the character traits and behaviors that are commanded and exemplified in the lives of Jesus' people, but the supreme example is Jesus himself. We have to look no further than to the example of Jesus who provided the context for what we think of when we think of spiritual maturity. And so what better example do we have than this? And I really like what someone said when it comes to Christian maturity. They said, we are as mature as we are like Christ and no more. Jesus' disciples followed him around for three years. They emulated him in what he did. They sought to mimic everything about their mentor. What did he think? How did he talk? How did he eat? I see this very often with my son, Soren, you know, especially when I'm working on projects around my house. And um, Soren loves to copy me. You know, he loves to see what I'm doing. So if I pick up a hammer and I start hammering away on some project that I'm working on, he will want to go find his hammer and he'll want to either help me with what I'm doing or do his own project like me. And uh, it reminds me of that. It it reminds me of um, a disciple and their rabbi. You know, disciples would follow a rabbi around and they would try to emulate what they were doing. And so just like Soren wants to copy what he sees in me, disciples desired to be this flawless copy of their rabbi. And, and they desired for other people to see the example of their rabbi in them. Uh, and so a big part of maturity in Christ is the same idea. It's mimicking or emulating him more regularly. The second environment that I think is conducive to spiritual maturity is information. Information. Another uh, big part of growing in maturity is through teaching and being taught. To be a Christian is sort of like to, to forever consider yourself as being a student in the university of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, we're always learning. We're always growing. And rabbis taught in the temple, but often uh, rabbis would teach away from the classroom and out on the roads and in the fields, in the marketplace, and even on the lakeshore, Everything in ordinary life became an illustration of the rabbi's teaching and most everything was taught in story form or riddles designed to drive home a point. So the idea here is that we are lifelong learners willing to be taught by uh, leadership, willing to be taught by Jesus and shown things where we need to grow. We need to take that next step. 
And then the third kind of environment that I think is conducive is examination. And we also see this again in the example of a rabbi and a disciple. Rabbis provided times of testing or examination. Think of Jesus' ministry for a second. Uh, You know, a terrifying lake storm, feeding 5,000 people, Peter and walking on the water. How about the betrayal in the garden? All times of testing. You can hear Jesus say, you know, in those moments, at at different times, where is your faith? When the storm is quieted, you know, you give them when, he, when Jesus was with the disciples and, and they were getting ready to feed the 5,000, he turned to the disciples and said, um, you give them something to eat. He demand, it's almost a demand that while he was pointing at the crowd, you give them something to eat. Um, you know, there was moments in, in, uh, in te- times of testing in the garden where, you know, he, he said things to the effect of, you're all going to forsake me. Or when he predicts, um, you know, what's going to happen to him. There were also very strong rebukes that Jesus would give out. You know, at one point he said, you know, famous words, get behind me, Satan. Not exactly the nicest way uh, to to correct, but hey, you know, it's Jesus here. What are we going to say to this? Um, And then there were questions that came from the rabbi. What were you discussing when I wasn't there? How about the assignments that he would give? You know, he, it, it says that he sent them out to preach and proclaim the kingdom of God. One thing I realized as I was looking through here at Jesus' example is, uh, you know, rabbis weren't always uh, nice guys. Um, they constantly raised the bar on their disciples. They are not reluctant to open up their own lives. Uh, they know how to prod at the inner space of their followers, and they know how to bring out the best in others. So be prepared while you grow into Christian maturity to face the difficult areas of your life as well as the habits or personality traits that need to be dissected and changed. That's part of the process of what it looks like to become spiritually mature. And so the three environments for progressing in Christian maturity, and they're not the only ones, but I think they're great, they're great spaces to learn and to grow, is emulation, information, and examination. I think these will provide a context as we think about our next steps as followers of Jesus. You know, I just want to close by talking about the mission of Elm City Church because I think it's really important when we think about growth and spiritual maturity. As a church, our mission is to practice the way of Jesus together. And I love in that statement that we love to take action when it comes to to the example of Jesus. This is sort of the foundation for our community. And so it's not just a nice slogan, but we're really actually trying to lead this community into following the way of Jesus, into living the life that Jesus lived out. And he gives us this example. And so it's a path. It's, it's sort of a, a footpath towards spiritual maturity. It's the one that Paul is talking about when he talks about what he wants to do or what his goal is going to be for us reaching the full maturity of Christ, being transformed into his likeness. And I think that that is a goal that is worth fighting for with all of our being. And yet, just as Christ calls us to this goal, it's also Christ's energy, which is the power source that will ensure that we reach it. See, we're not passive in this process. We still press on the gas pedal and grab onto the steering wheel. But we know that it's Christ's power, which is the fire that keeps the engine roaring. And by his strength and our desire, we will grow into the type of person who looks more like him with each and every passing day. Let's pray together. Jesus, we ask that you would mold us and shape us into the type of people that you're looking for. The, the, the type of people that are growing in maturity in you every day. The type of people that are willing to see what those areas of our lives are, where we need to dissect, and we need to take examination, and we need to look at what is possibly not of you. I want to just ask that you would help our community and myself today to just, to just see those things, just reveal those places in us where we need to take that examination or that hard look, Lord, where we need to emulate more of what you look like in the world and less of ourselves. Help us to do this as a community as we shine a light in this world as a witness to the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.
joys found communion with you beholding So oh. 
throne of grace We've come to worship We've come to fall down Seek only your face Laying down our crowns Oh, we've come to worship We've come to fall down Seek only your face Laying down our crowns We hope that this service today was helpful for you. And if you'd like further connection with Elm City Church, we'd invite you to join a life group. Life groups meet every week and you can get more information online at elmcitychurch.com slash groups. If you'd like to support the ongoing mission of Elm City Church, we'd like to invite you to give financially. You can get more information about giving safely and securely online at elmcitychurch.com slash give. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you tune in next week. Bye everyone. <laughs>